Yeah, welcome everyone. This is Mary Eggert, and I'm with uh, Global Waterworks, the founder, and uh, here for our weekly Network for Water uh, presentation. And I'm delighted to say we are going to focus on Singapore, a leader with uh, water innovation because of needs that that country faced. And uh, we have Chris Childress joining us. It's 11 p.m. his time, so uh, we all owe Chris a great. Uh, um, thanks for, for staying up with us, and he is a professed night owl, so uh, he's going to clue us in on what's going on in Singapore in hopes that you can tap that technology more easily, and if you have time and interest, uh, join him for the Singapore International Water Week coming up July 10th through the 14th, a gathering of about uh, 20,000 pros, which he'll share a little more about at the end. Um, but because we want to be respectful of time, and uh, you can find us online at any time, I just wanted to let everyone know Global Water Works is a trade association. We are designed to accelerate uh, the adoption of smart water technology, and uh, the gap that we fill in the industry is really helping people gain awareness of where water is working through this smart technology and for profit so that they can also learn about the experts and these technologies and find the best solution to address their water needs. And this is particularly important because of our growing scarcity issues. Um, right now, uh, a great deal of the world faces scarcity for uh, a portion of the year. In fact, I think it's uh, three-fourths of the world, uh, which was um, reported in the New York Times earlier this year. And what we are hoping to do is avert a uh, crisis where we see a 40% gap between supply and demand for water, which has been predicted by McKinsey and the World Bank to happen by the year 2030. So if you weren't aware that we are up against a, a serious shortage, we invite you to visit our website, uh, view the videos on our YouTube channel. We've curated all of the experts and share with us also where you see water working in uh, our Make an Impact portion of our website where we invite case studies. And uh, also we invite you to join our LinkedIn group uh, to meet the experts, to share your questions, and hopefully to more immediately get answers to solutions in between our uh, biweekly Network for Water uh, videos. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to a good friend of mine, um, Chris Childress, who is actually a mentor in the uh, Singapore, um, the National University of Singapore Enterprise Incubator. And he's going to share with us uh, the work that his teams are doing. And um, I'm just thrilled to have someone who shares our passion for making water work with us today and invite you all to hook up also with Christoph Childress on LinkedIn uh, because he is very well networked and a great resource as you'll hear right now. So Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, he hello everyone and uh, hello from, from Singapore. As I, I tease Mary, I said I think she likes me for I'm an old friend and I I live in Singapore, but I'm also, as she said, it's something of a night owl, so I can I can yeah. get on. It's actually 11, uh, just after 11 p.m. here in Singapore, but uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm glad, appreciate the opportunity to be on the call. The picture you see in front of you is the waterfront in Singapore, and it's kind of interesting. The, the, the Singapore is the lion city. That's really what Singapore means. It refers to the lion back in the history. And the symbol, one of the symbols of Singapore is the merlion, which is uh, the head of a lion and the body of a fish. And this is one down on the waterfront that sprays water out, and it's quite an, an icon that people come and make pictures of. And, of course, they've licensed the, the image all over the world. So water is very historically very integral to us as, a, as an island nation. You go on to the next slide. Um, full disclosure, I do not work for the Public Utility Board of Singapore. However, I was recently in Melbourne at a conference, and we shared their booth that they had paid for. So they issued us all with badges. So I would have fellows coming into the... Well, two of that would people come and ask me, are you the public utility board of Singapore? And they would start asking me questions about public policy and things. And I would have to say I wasn't. And several Australian men came in and asked where the beer was because they saw we were a pub. But uh, <laughs> it's very famous as the public utility board. Um, a brief, I'm going to talk about a brief history of water in Singapore, very brief, very high level. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Singapore's water blueprint, kind of an overview of what we're doing as a nation. And then I'm going to talk about three innovations, including uh, one that I'm working with doing business development, MEDAD, that are available today and doing work uh, globally. And then also talk a little bit about um, some of the highlights of the Singapore International Water Week. 
Um, yes, just a reminder to everyone, our, our session here is supposed to be about 20, 25 minutes with the overview, but if you do have questions or need to run, please note them in our message box and we'll tend to them and we'll also post this online after the presentation so you can get those answers. And uh, you can go ahead, Chris. So basically, just a quick overview of Singapore. Many people know where it is. Some people occasionally think it's in China because we have predominantly Chinese population. But we're actually in the southern tip of Malaysia. We're very small. Our land area is about 719 square kilometers. For reference, Chicago itself is 606 square kilometers. So it gives you an idea of the size of our country in aggregate. It is growing slightly because they continue to reclaim small amounts of land slowly from the sea but it's obviously never going to be a large country. Our population is about 5.4 million as of 2013. That is also continuing to grow with uh, immigration. Uh, it's a very popular place to live, very high standard of living and, and relatively high incomes for this part of the world. Our water demand per capita right now stands at about 151 liters per day, which is quite good for a developed world country. And it is continuing to come down. A few years ago, I looked about four years ago, it was 165. So we're reducing that. And what Singapore's overall water approach is based on is what we call the four national taps. And so generally, any new technology that's launched, any initiative that's taken, generally falls under one of these four taps. The first one is catchment water, which is our reservoirs, the water that's falling, the water in our storm drains. How do we how do we capture that and hold it and, and then make it available for, for use for drinking and other things? And that right now is 10% and will be a smaller percentage over time because all of that water uh, is basically coming from the sky and we have limited land. Um, new water is the second source and that is actually purified water where we take uh, used, used water. I won't be more graphic than that, but used water uh, coming out of our sewage system and then we, we Sub, uh, subjected to reverse osmosis and, and bring it up to a very high level of purity. A lot of it is used by industry where they need very high purity water and then a portion of it is, is poured back into our reservoirs and becomes part of our drinking water supply indirectly and that's a very important source. The third which is our largest source is imported water. We currently have a, a, a 99 year lease from Malaysia and that accounts for about 60 percent of our water, about 250 million gallons a day. The problem with that is, of course, it's politically sensitive. We know that it probably will not renew that contract after 2061, so it's a finite length. And also we uh, face the issue that, that Malaysia sometimes has their own droughts. So we actually sell them drinking water back, and last year we had to increase the amount of drinking water that Singapore sells to Johor, which is our nearest state, because they were in a, a drought condition. And then finally, another growing source of water is desalinated water, uh, which is, again, primarily using reverse osmosis, um, and those are large plants that are being built, and that's increasing as a percentage of our water supply. Go to the next slide. Yeah, oops, sorry. There we go. And I, I think, Chris, just one question around the, the four taps and the motivation for that diversification, which we're seeing happen more and more frequently around the hey, globe. This is Mom. Hey, welcome. Yeah. And, um, Welcome everyone as we're uh, continuing the discussion. I just will invite you to ask any questions through the message box. So we'll um, attend to those at the end of Chris's presentation. But I think a key part of Singapore is the diversified water sources and the motivation for that. And if you could just share with people what made that happen and the well, if you, that you look, if you go back to that real quickly, it might be as useful showing it. If you, if you look at in 1965 when we became an independent country, my understanding is almost all of our water came from local catchment water, which was a small amount, and also from imported water from Malaysia. And we realized that neither of those were subject to increasing amounts and, and actually everything over time would probably either fix them or reduce them as amount of meeting our water needs. And we knew that as we were becoming more industrialized, we would need more water. So we began to look at, while we wanted to improve the local catchment, and we have significantly, we knew that was finite, and we wanted to look at other means of getting water. So one, obviously, that's not listed here was conservation, as I mentioned, reducing the use and using water more efficiently. But the other was recycling water, which is what new water is. And then the final one was desalinated water. So we really have gone from what would have been the two taps in 1965 when we became an independent country to now the four taps. And the idea is that we sort of look and say, are there ways that we can continue? And they will certainly look at local catchment. They built a huge 
reservoir just down the marina barrage down on the coast that just opened a couple of years ago. They, they started building it after I arrived and they basically pumped out a bit like the Dutch. They pumped out a significant amount of seawater and then replaced it with fresh water from the river and it now meets about 10% of our catchment needs. So it's, we are looking at that but we realize just because we're so small and because we are so dependent on a, our neighboring country for water that we had to look at other ways to sustain our water supply. Right, and that brings us to the necessity is the mother of invention, and you have some great innovations uh, here happening in Singapore. I want to talk first a little bit about an initiative that's come out of the, the PUB, which is they're very progressive as a municipality and have been very involved with it. They put on something every other year in tandem with the Singapore International Water Week, something called Hydropreneur. And I, this year and, and two years ago, I was one of the, the mentors for this program. It's basically a 12-week sort of a lean launch pad where each one of these water technology companies, they may be, list, may be looking at a means of testing or treating or some sort of a, a widget, you know, that's important in the overall uh, scheme of water where we work with them to understand and validate the business idea, look at the competitive environment and get them ready actually to pitch at the Singapore International Water Week. And then one of them, which uh, two years ago was Water Roam, I'll talk about later, actually won a couple of years ago. So it's a way for them to understand the need for their technology and validate that and also begin conversations with potential collaborators or, or markets. Um, and I can talk about other questions, I can talk about that more. I wanted to talk with a mature, they're really not a startup anymore obviously, but I wanted to talk with a mature startup that started in 1989 called Hyflux. Uh, the founder was Olivia Lum. And she basically developed this technology of reverse osmosis in Singapore for purifying water and very quickly expanded overseas. She started in 1989 basically with her own you know, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, you, uh, roughly US $15,000 and three staff. And then since then, since 1989, of course, they've rapidly expanded both in Singapore and abroad, and today they, they treat uh, and these numbers are not up to date. I think they'd be slightly higher now. Over 1.4 million uh, tons a day of water in 44 countries. Uh, they currently have 29 water projects in China alone, and their largest plant as of, the, as of this date was, uh, when this was created, was about a half a million tons a day of water at a desalination plant in Algeria. So they really have scaled massively um, in projects, primarily looking at membrane technology, a lot of reverse osmosis, but nanofiltration, ultrafiltration, and other kinds of technologies as well. So they are really, we point to them as a water success story in Singapore, where they now are, are obviously a, a global player. And they're now, I think, just trying to raise about a $450 million funding round I saw in the paper the other day. So these are, these are big, and they, they're a, a kind of an inspiration for the, the younger companies coming out. The next company is a company that I'm doing business development with, and it's called Medad. And basically, we are looking at the other means of desalinating water, of purifying water, which is by evaporation. Um, and if you're familiar with traditional distillation, as it's done in the Middle East, they traditionally use, uh, it's a very high energy, they'll burn a lot of oil and natural gas, and basically boil the water off and then condense it with coolers and collect it. It's extremely high purity, but it requires an enormous amount of energy and it's really not practical in many cases, which is why the market in many areas has moved towards reverse osmosis, which is also energy intensive, but less energy intensive than traditional distillation. The labs at NUS um, developed a technology for using adsorption, AD, and not absorption, but adsorption. So it's very much like the silica gel that you might find in an appliance that keeps it dry or an item that's being shipped, except we use large beds of it. This is actually an installation where the beds are at the top. And basically what they do is they adsorb the water. I'll show you a diagram in just a minute. They adsorb the water from a, from a, a contaminated stream of water. It could be RO reject. It could be brackish groundwater. It could be uh, some other highly contaminated high solid source. They have a very high recovery because we're just distilled water and it produces an ultra pure water, um, typically less than five parts per million of contaminants. If you look at, at RO water, it's typically something under, under 200 ppm. So this is water that could be used for like boiler water or in a fab plant or other high purity kinds of applications. What's interesting about it is it also runs at very low temperature because it's powered by low grade heat using adsorption. 
So basically, uh, oh, and it has a very low energy content and, and other applications. If you'll go to the next slide, I'll talk just very, very high level about how the technology works. So basically what happens with this is we have a series of beds of the silica gel, and as we open them up, like you see on the left, to the water stream, the water actually evaporates by the, is driven to evaporate and absorbed into the column. And once the column becomes saturated, then we pump hot water through it, typically up to about 85 degrees centigrade, in which case it desorbs, and we close the valve off, the entry valve for the water, and then when it desorbs, it desorbs back into the condenser on the top. Once the desorption is completed, then we put cool water, typically 30 to 34 degrees centigrade through it, and it refreshes the column. Then we can open up again, and it begins reabsorbing. So we use these in series and, and very rapidly recover water. And, and I'm doing business development and looking at, at other applications besides traditional desalination for this technology. So yeah, if you'll go on to the next slide, Mary. And uh, the... The third technology I'd like to talk about here, and I want to talk a little bit more about this because I think it's sort of a, a global, potential global player, is a company called Water Roam. And as I mentioned, they won, two years ago, they won a uh, hydropreneur pitch at, at uh, International Water, Singapore International Water Week. Uh, these are the three founders. The CEO that I know fairly well is David Pong, but he has two other young, uh, fresh grads from NUS working with him. He's a, he's a business major. The other two are engineers. Basically what they've done is they identified a strong need initially for disaster relief for water. That very often when there's a disaster and the water system goes down, these areas will ship in uh, massive bottles, you know, lots of bottles of drinking water, and eventually when the roads open, they'll bring in carboys, of, uh, you know, uh, tanker loads of water. And then there are large purification systems. But their, their vision was to have small, low-tech, portable water filtration technology. And so that's really what they've developed initially for disaster relief. And increasingly, they're looking at it for more of a sustainable drinking water need in a lot of villages. They've worked with, uh, so far, with World Vision, Singapore Red Cross, and CARE, among others. Um, 15,000 people have already uh, benefited in various, in various places in Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia, Myanmar, Burma, Nepal, and Vanuatu, uh, and they've sold 3,000 of their smaller, smaller capacity leaders, uh, 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 filters. If you'll go to the next slide, this is the, the one on the left is actually the traditional filter that they've had, and they've sold a number of these. And it basically holds uh, just a, a few liters of water, and it's gravity-fed, and it has a ceramic membrane in the bottom. And, and basically, based on gravity, when they open that little tube, that white tube you see on the rock there, when they open the valve on that, it begins releasing pure water that's been forced by gravity down through the filter. It can be collapsed and carried. It's extremely lightweight. It's very inexpensive. The retail price is U.S. $25. And it really is a, a lifesaver in like I said, in disaster relief or where you rapidly need water for maybe a household or a few people. But what they saw, and they're, they're looking now, it was there was really a drive for larger systems, for, for example, more of a village level. And that's the system that they're just coming out with now called the field rate. And that would be typically for a village of maybe, say, as here, 150 people. Um, it, it's basically, it, it's a bit like a large bicycle pump. You set it up in a few minutes, uh, and then you begin uh, pumping it. As it pumps, it draws the dirty water in. It could be from a, a river or from a, a pond um, or some other source of contaminated water. And it'll produce up to 250 liters of clean drinking water per hour. And it's been uh, certified uh, by a number of boards. It requires no electricity to operate. It weighs about three kilograms. And they've rated it to have two years of durable operation. So it should operate for two years before it either needs to be replaced or refurbished. And in addition to the hand pump, they also said it lends itself if you have the ability to gravity feed it or you have solar energy or you set it up with a bicycle. There are other means that you could supply the, the energy actually for that. So they are actively looking at this not only for disaster relief and for charity, but also they're working now on a on the idea of a micro entrepreneur model for this, where they would actually um, sell this to an entrepreneur in a village or a, a locale, and th that person would actually then purify water and sell it to the other villagers for a small amount of money, and then that money would be used to pay off a micro loan that they've taken out to pay for the unit. And they they they're estimating from some things that they could potentially 
uh, get like a one year payback and then after that it would, the, the entrepreneur would get a year of uh, basically free use and then after that they'll work on a program for less than the $250 hoping to come up with a program where they could just replace and refurbish the filters at a lower cost. So it'd be a long term sustainable economically driven way to provide high quality drinking water in, uh, in remote rural areas. So that is, is water roam. So I've, I've yeah. covered kind of from the big to the medium, which is a large industrial, to this, which is very much a, a personal. And these are the web addresses. You're welcome to look up any of those. For High Flux, I have no relationship with them other than I admire their work. MEDAD, I'm doing business development. And Water Realm, I am, I am their mentor. And so with I, that, go, go ahead, please. Oh, I was just going to say, Chris, I think there are many different companies around the world that are doing these individual use uh, solutions like Water Realm. How do you all share the intellectual property and avoid, you know, the exhaustive, you know, creation efforts by tapping I insights and knowledge? Well, basically what Water Realm, I mean, they do, they have patented some of their technology, but they would admit that their technology per se is not it's not world beating. It's not like Medads is actually a really powerful technology. Water Realm is not. And in the case of Water Realm, what they're working on is to say they want to come up with a model where they make it affordable and durable. And then the, the big issue is to look at like what are the economic models that will drive adoption of it. So for example, uh, recently at a conference, they looked at a, a different, a very different kind of technology coming out of other labs here that might do something similar to what they're doing and have some potential advantages. And so they're already in talks with that other technology provider about saying, okay, we have the network, we have the experience, we have the brand, we have the exposure. Can we leverage your technology, because you're a technology provider and not really a, a business per se, can we leverage that and use that as part of our offering, where, where it fits into our overall plan. So a lot of it really comes down, it's, it's, the technology is important, but a lot of it is developing the relationships and the network and the reputation, because in this case, a lot of theirs is not going to be B to C, it's really B to B to C, business to business or business to NGO, and then the business or NGO they're selling to will then turn around and provide it to the end user. Right, and I think um, the opportunity to partner with folks like Rotary or, as you were saying, with World Vision who have the business models to help the people, um, you know, the locals actually implement this for business. Uh, there are also some special payment processes that allow for the micropayments to be uh, handled in a very well, those effective are the partners. way. They know the lay of the land. They know the language. They know the culture. They have credibility on the ground. So Water Realm doesn't try to replace them. It tries to partner with them where it's possible to get the technology out. So they're a business that provides technology, but they realize the need for partnerships. Um, you'd asked me to give a few key takeaways, and I'll do these quickly and then get on and, and just touch on the Singapore National Water Week. Um, with few exceptions, uh, our, my experience when we commercialize technologies, municipalities, municipalities as a whole don't tend to be water innovators. You're right earlier, PUV is an exception. I think there are some within the U.S. and elsewhere that do actually innovate. But our experience has been that a lot of times it makes more sense to look at engineering firms and industrial applications where that makes sense first because they often can, once the numbers are right and it looks good, they don't have the political issues sometimes of bringing in technology and the exposure. So we've often found that, that, that industry um, or some progressive government sometimes will bring these in technologies in more rapidly. And this came out of the hydropreneurs discussions. They're not saying, don't deal with municipalities, but as a rule, be cautious about kind of getting lost in that process. The other thing is that most technology and waters are not standalone, and we just, we're talking about with water roam, but are often part of a complete system. So there may be uh, 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 something before, something after. Uh, it may fit into an entire culture and be used in particular places. So I also talk with, with uh, our entrepreneurs about understanding where their technology fits in in the domain. And then also, like I said, we're looking at commercializer, looking at, at typically either domain and domain partners, such as engineering firms and consultants, and technology partners. Could be someone like a General Electric or a Veolia, um, someone that provides a more complete solution and where they see your technology as being enabling that to happen. 
So I often tell guys, I said, don't, don't get lost in the weeds of trying to come up with a complete solution. And then finally, the last thing is we, we look for sweet spots. Like with me, Dad, we actually found a case where they were trucking water inland and the seawater and then purifying with RO. And the real advantage of our system was that we could let them recover the RO reject water, which was about half the water that goes into the reverse osmosis and get a net like 85 or 90% recovery, which was much higher than the 50% recovery they were getting with RO alone and use waste heat from the produ the, uh, this production process in the cement plant in the, in the desert. So we often look for initially are there real sweet spots where the technology has a lot of benefits? And I know we're running out of time, so let me just touch very briefly on Singapore International Water Week and put out an, uh, an invitation. In 2014, we had 20,000 participants from 133 countries and regions. It has a lot of specific um, events within it. Uh, there's a water leader summit. There's a convention and an exposition. There are different business forums. They look at industrial water. So within it, it's, a, it's an umbrella for a lot of different things happening in water. And it's kind of, particularly in, the, in, the, in Asia and to some extent in the Middle East, and, and to some extent globally, it's become one of the places that a lot of people try to show up every two years. So we usually have an old home week every two years for people that I haven't seen for years who just show up. And, and come and either to attend and or exhibit and, and actually do business. So with that, I think that brings us to the right to the our... questions. And Chris, phenomenal job, as everyone can hear on the line. You are just a great storyteller. Uh, you know what's important to convey with these technologies. And I know you're traveling the globe. You were just in Australia, as you shared, to help uh, people partner and understand what Singapore has to offer. So uh, we did have a few questions from the group, and um, maybe you could cue those up, Maria. Sure. Uh, the first one's from Steve Lavi about replacement membranes and the cost. Um, you came up for water room. I, I don't have yeah. that information. I can get that for you, but I don't have that. Right now, they're not replacing them. Normally, the current thing with the small ones, obviously, it's, it doesn't make sense. They they replace the whole thing, the small filtrate. The larger ones, they're looking at what the cost would be on that. Um, but right now, it's a complete replacement at the moment. Um, okay. Here's uh, another. Steve, did you have any other questions or follow up for that? Can you talk? Uh, just, just, yeah, just related to uh, uh, water roam, Chris. Um, you know, when we think about all of these water startups uh, <clears throat> that are trying to solve various problems, Obviously, the big issue for a startup is to generate revenues to take what is a hobby into a real business that can, that can pay salaries and that sort of thing. So who is the market for water roam in order for them to become sustainable? Do they have to go to uh, a large NGO or do they try to sell to a uh, Veolia? Or what's their market in order to get profitable? Typically, and I can get a conference call with, with David Pong, he can give you more details, but typically uh, they wouldn't work with a Veolia or G. Those, usually those are involved in like large scale municipal and industrial projects, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And they don't, except as a, as a, consume, a, a community service, they really wouldn't normally get involved in these things. What they do is they typically work with NGOs that are on the ground. Initially, they looked at, at disaster relief. So going into areas where they, like in Nepal, where they have an earthquake or a flood and it actually takes out the, the clean water system and, and they're doing that. And increasingly they're looking at, at, at other things um, and I don't know the details there, he's, he's in Hong Kong this week, but they're looking at, at partnerships with typically with probably more with NGOs who are trying to bring good to the, okay. to the, to the ground. And in theory this could be almost anyone, I mean you could be, you know, Wycliffe Bible translators for that matter, but some NGO that says either we're trying to develop a business, like a local business to support a, a small-scale entrepreneur, and or we see that there's a real need for pure water in an area. Maybe they have a lot of waterborne illness, and they've been able to say, look, if we can supply clean water, we can uplift the quality of life for these people and reduce death and medical costs and things like that. So it's a, it's okay. a gradually evolving situation. We're looking at how to get that into the field. And you talked about municipalities as a governmental unit not being innovators. Do governments see the need to sponsor this innovation? And so do they throw a small contract at somebody like Water Rome to make sure that it gets developed because they need to see this innovation? Or 
Are, are they likely customers? Are governmental units likely customers? They can be, but in my experience a lot of times is government, a lot of places, my, my personal experience, they tend to follow what's kind of been already been validated in the industry. So a lot of times it'll go from the lab to industrial applications where they're, it's a faster turnaround and they're really looking for, okay, if you can improve my bottom line by 15 or 20%, you know, reduce my cost of, of disposing of water or give me more pure water, cheaper, I can show up an ROI, then I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. Whereas when you gotcha. get into government, they're usually big long-term projects for like wastewater plants and things like that. And they have not as a group, like they're exceptions, but as a group, I have not seen municipalities be that, that innovative. When you get to a national level, Israel and Singapore obviously are the are the are the, the outliers here. But yeah, I would think in the US now where you might find government organizations doing it sometimes might be like the military, places where they have a specific mission and they say we need you know, we have a specific water need and we go out and source the technology. But you know, so DARPA might do work, but if you look at, at municipal, local municipal governments, they're basically just trying to kind of cover their cover their their, their bottoms before the next election, unfortunately. Gotcha. Yeah, and Thank you. Chief, some of the places we're seeing more of that investment take place for the innovation is with the water incubators, like uh, the Water Council in Milwaukee, uh, Imagine H2O in San Francisco, and then with uh, organizations like the Gates Foundation, who have made it, or the MacArthur Foundation, who have made it public that they want to accelerate water innovation. And that so seems Singapore to be how does that. We have like membrane initiative and things. There are things in some of the, uh, some of the, pol uh, uh, the polys here are doing the, 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 the educational institutions are putting quite a bit of work in, into trying to come up with viable technologies. But it's usually coming from kind of an R&D university and or, or, biz, or industry, and then it's often being pushed by industry in these incubators, and typically municipalities have historically come kind of farther down. Um, Great. I, I think just one other comment on Steve's expertise, Steve Levy on um, online, he's worked with Opportunity International, helped launch a business I was part of and is a great resource if you do have a business plan or something. I hope um, you don't mind my saying so, Steve, you are very smart about putting together the uh, economic model and making a case for investors to get involved in water. And um, just if people are on the call looking for investment ideas too, uh, you can Google financial models for water sustainability for these big investments uh, because taxation is not a really attractive way to fund water projects. Uh, they've uh, recommended private-public partnerships and provided very detailed information about what those models could look like. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you, Steve. Question. One from Imran. Is there an RO plant that can defluorinate water, such as in rural areas where electricity is not available? You mean actually take the fluorine out of water or put fluorine into water? I just want to try to understand the question. It says defluorinate water. Now, I'm not sure Amr Imran can speak with us. So, Imran, can you hear? Mm. Yeah, Imran, I'm not, I'm not familiar with work done on, on, on fluorination or defluorination of water. I know they've had problems like with lead and things, and there's been work going on for technologies to remove unwanted minerals from water, but I don't know the specific one. Okay. Okay. Uh, here's I'm another not, question. I'm not, I'm not... Oh, okay. Go ahead. What is the energy consumption for adsorption technology, and what do they do with the brine? Okay. I guess that's, well, typically uh, what happens is the energy consumption, electricity energy consumption is about one, the, the ones we run before for, for RO reject was a less than 1.4 kilowatt hours per, per metric ton. That doesn't include the energy from the heat because typically we're using waste heat and we're basing the assumption that you have plenty of that very low grade waste heat available. Um, and I don't have the figures our engineers could give. There's, there's, a, there's an energy equivalent if you had to purposefully generate that hot water, which mm -hmm. actually in some applications we're looking and people are saying they, that might make sense. They might set up a cogen plant, gas, you know, use gas, uh, gas fired cogen plant, make electricity, and then the hot water could be used for, for providing the high purity water they need. The, um, the reject is basically to be very concentrated and, and depending on the application, um, it could go to like to evaporation ponds. Um, it could be taken care of by a local municipality. 
in some cases, when you're looking at things like solution mining, there may be an economic value. And in some cases, people are actually really interested in the brine and certain types of brine because they can have rare earth minerals or lithium or, or table salt or other things in them. So it really depends on a, it's a case by case basis. But right now, RO reject, typical seawater is about 50% reject. We can take that down to maybe, for the t initial total water, down to maybe, say, 10 or 15%. So much smaller amount of water rejected by our system than, than by what you would see with, a, with a, an RO system. Okay, I have another question. Um, so these technologies, have they been implemented in the U.S. or any other parts of the world? Uh, the water, I, I flex is all over the place, and you can look at there as I know they've done a lot of work in the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, they have a huge, huge in China, huge list of, of international installations. MEDAD, our first system, is now in use in, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, we are talking with other countries about, about using the technology for other applications, but those are typically... Uh, probably six months to a year lead time from the time of the first conversation till we actually close anything because they're typically multi-million dollar installations and have to, to jump through some hoops to get those out. Uh, but we're looking at a lot of applications for MEDAD. We also have a, a pilot plant at, the, at uh, National University of Singapore that can do, I think it's about 15 tons a day of water. So it's a pretty good sized pilot operation um, and, some, and some also in the Middle East. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and uh, for water roam, as I said, they have a number of, of filters that have been shipped out over the, the smaller filters all over Southeast Asia. The filtrate system, they're actually working now, they're trying to find a group of, of, of first movers who are interested in taking them. Probably they're going to be manufacturing the, in bulk the first group of that in the next few months. And they're actually looking for organizations that might validate the, the, the system in the field. So they're, they're looking at actually distributing. So if someone's interested in being one of those and feels that you have a good exposure and would, would make good use of it, let me know and I'll put you in touch with the founders. Okay. I have another question from Imran. How does one attend Singapore Week and are there any grants for organizations that sponsor attendees? Do you know? I don't know if there are any grants or organizations that sponsor attendees. I mean, most of the, a lot of them are coming commercially. I do know that for people, I think there are, and don't, don't hold me to this because I'm not, I'm not involved in a data. I think there are lower attendance fees for people coming from certain nations that, in other words, if you're coming from an identified developing nation on the United Nations scale, I think they have a lower cost uh, for, for the conference itself, but you'd have to double check that. Um, but anyone can attend. Uh, obviously, the exposition is free, and some of, the other, some of the other venues you can pay individually or you can pay the overall cost for doing it. Um, but I don't know about, about grants or, or scholarships. Okay. And I think I have uh, two more short questions. In brief, how did you end up working with uh, water in Singapore? And you might have said, told us in the beginning, but, and the other one is, have you found U.S. leaders uh, open to learning from Singapore? Okay, the first question is, I, I'm basically a, an all-purpose mentor. I do work with water, but I also work with other technologies. And when I came, I had a background in technology startups, in energy, and in analysis, and uh, in software. And so I came and, and couldn't really find a role in a company based on with some of my experience, but I found a role that they needed mentors in the startup for the startups. So I actually went to work for National University and I naturally gravitated towards water because I have a biology degree and some background and understanding of the space. Um, the, the, the second question on, on it's interesting, I have found um, my experience is sometimes the big global companies are, seem to be a little bit surprised when new technologies come out of some place like Singapore. And you may have found some of this historically with Israel. They tend to think, well, the new breakthrough technologies should come from the U.S. or Germany or, you know, one of the more recognized developed countries. But uh, we had a case recently where we were literally trying to present the media technology to, an, to a, a technology team, and the guy just... He could not get it. It was like we, you know, we kept kind of spelling the pieces out, and he just really struggled with it. But we're not sure why. Um, it might have been that we didn't present the original information correctly. Um, but certainly, when they see the results, um, when someone sees that you built a 500-ton-a-day unit, 
and it's operating in high heat in the desert in Saudi Arabia and you're having good success, then that obviously, that, that kind of scale gets their attention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's well, great. thanks. That's great. Yeah, and I think, uh, Chris, uh, to the point on ROI and that type of scale that you talked about, it is really about showing evidence of being able to generate water where you don't have it or to minimize the risk that you mentioned Singapore started out with, depending on all of its neighbors for the majority of its water or on Malaysia for 60%, yeah, really is, is a great motivation. And if you can... Um, have control, mitigate risk, increase resilience, you have more opportunities to, um, to manage your future. And that's what we're seeing is water is a proxy for uh, efficient government, efficient corporate management, and, uh, and just um, our, our future water use and, uh, and opportunities. And we're also seeing a distributed a- aspect of water where people can harvest water and uh, then reuse it and resell it. As you were saying, you were actually selling back. Um, and because of the systems nature of water, next, our next session on June 7th, we will actually talk about how you think about water and the different uh, partners that need to come together to create water solutions that don't have upstream or downstream consequences uh, because it's all one water in the end. And uh, the folks at Think Water are out of uh, Cornell University. It's a phenomenal group funded with about a million dollar grant from the USDA. And they are uh, helping us educate business leaders on the uh, different systems that need to be considered and how you collaborate uh, for a sustainable solution. So we hope everyone will join us for that. And, on June 7th, and it's the same time, same, actually we'll have a new dial in um, so that we have everyone accessible internationally. And um, I also wanted to point out there are some events on the horizon that people should be aware of. The Water Council's uh, Summit is happening June 10th and 11th in Milwaukee, and that's listed in our LinkedIn group. Uh, You'll see uh, the LinkedIn URL that you can access us with. Uh, right there on your screen. And what we do welcome is uh, your suggestions for events that would be helpful for people who want to expand their knowledge and uh, or resources or just their network uh, to do more more intelligently with water. Um, and three other events, um, the ACE, the, um, the annual uh, conference and exposition for the American Water Works Association is here in Chicago, a very rare occurrence. Uh, July 20th to the 22nd, and then um, Israel is bringing its water experts from WATAC to um, uh, Los Angeles to help address the drought, and that's happening uh, June 28th through the 30th, and that is a a very important event uh, with, uh, you can actually meet with the innovators of 28 Israeli companies with B2B meetings alongside that event, and we'll post that to our LinkedIn group as well. And I think uh, the last one was the Singapore International Water Week, and we hope people will get to meet Chris in person because he's as delightful in person and also has all of these other interests, biking, the islands, he can be your tour guide. But uh, uh, anything else you want to add, Chris? No, thank you. I appreciate everyone's patience. I, if I was a little blurry tonight because of uh, being 11, I apologize, but I hope it was, uh, I hope it was helpful for people. Well, we hope you'll go get a beer at your pub and uh, and relax for the rest of your evening. But uh, but at the uh, the pub in the house for now. But um, thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone who joined us for your your comments, your questions. If there are any additional thoughts, we'll have this posted to YouTube, and you can comment there. And also, uh, we invite your um, your contributions to our LinkedIn group. And our our goal is to network the world for water, so that you have access and know who the innovators are, like Singapore, and the technologies that can be implemented today. Uh, for water security, water reclamation, and new water opportunities. Um, So um, thank you again, Chris. Really appreciate your help and your great work over there. All right. Thanks. Good talking with you.